Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Ghost Education 101. We are excited to be here for 2024. Yeah, and before we bring our guest in, I wanted to just have Philip here and say thank you for an amazing introduction. Yeah, <laughs> I put some of my childhood pictures on there, some home videos. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely love it. Um, I want to thank you for that hard work and putting that all together. It's I did work amazing. hard on that sucker, pasting and cutting and yeah, like putting in screens. I thought, well, we need to kick it up a notch this year. So Exactly. And I think you actually right. sent me two or three copies of it. You're like, hey, oh, we're going to do this one. It. And then I've edited it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I wasn't quite happy to, you know, so that's it. Oh, perfect. And real quick, before we bring Alan in, I just want to say hello, Stephen. Tiffany hey. and Bob for joining us. And hey, Stephen says Bob. that he loves you, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. Tiffany, yay. Yep. Got some so, good people tonight. Exactly. So feel free to ask any questions you guys have throughout the show. Um, I will make sure I flag them and that we answer them at least before we are done. And if we don't know it and our guest doesn't know the answer, we will definitely find that answer for you. So before we continue babbling and forget that he's backstage, let's bring <laughs> Alan into the show. Hey, Alan, thanks for joining hey, us today. Alan. Thanks for having me. It's great being here. Perfect. And for people who don't know who you are, you are with the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigations. And can you just kind of explain to people a little bit more about you, why you're in the paranormal, and uh, maybe touch on a little bit of what CPRI is all about? Sure. Um, I have, um, well, my background is in law enforcement, and I did... 26 years as a police officer, uh, criminal investigator, law enforcement trainer uh, in the years before I retired. Um, uh, retired this summer. Wow. You um, look too young to be retired already. <laughs> <laughs> they, they let us go at 50. So I hit the wow. magic number. Nice. Um, so uh, I that is my professional background. Um, and that's where a lot of my investigative background comes from. Um, but I have been involved in this particular field with CPRI the whole time I've been in it uh, for 17 years now. Um, and I currently serve on our board of directors and also serve as our central uh, region uh, director handling cases that come through central Virginia area. Uh, we are, I am based out of uh, the Richmond metropolitan area, the capital of the state, pretty much dead center of everything. And um, we, um, I think we are kind of different in that one, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we are fully insured as of this past year. We, we took care of that. But more importantly, we approach the study of the paranormal from a purely scientific perspective. Um, so we're, we're not looking at this as a, a, a metaphysical thing. We are looking at it from the standpoint of collecting quantifiable data um, that can hopefully show correlation, which I think we've done a lot of that. And I know Brad, our research director, has been on with you before and talked mm -hmm. extensively about that. Yes. Um, but then ultimately, hopefully, causation. And one of our beliefs is that a lot of this, most of this, is likely rooted in something that is scientifically explainable, even if we cannot currently explain it via science. Now, would you say that you believe in ghosts in the afterlife and you're looking for scientific ways to prove it? Are you saying that there's scientific explanations for things that we perceive to be ghosts and paranormal? Or a little bit of both? Well, you use that word, belief. Uh -huh. And um, there are things that I believe, uh -huh. um, like, for example, uh, I was raised in the Episcopal Church. Okay. So I, I have a religious background. Uh -huh. um, other people in our organization have religious backgrounds. They vary. Um, they have different belief structures. Uh, some have come into the group uh, with no belief structures whatsoever. Um, so there's belief and then there's what I can show as a researcher or a scientist. And for somebody like me whose background is entirely in the humanities, I use the term scientist loosely. Um, but 
as a researcher, I can only tell you that which I can tell you. I can tell you what I think, but that doesn't mm-hmm. that's just what I think. It doesn't make sense. Did you have a paranormal experience early on that led you into this? Like most people in this um, paranormal investigating world had some catalyst that propelled them into investigating? Yeah, I think I have been interested in this type of stuff for as long as I can even remember. Um, going back to, I mean, my son's a, uh, 10, and I remember being younger than that. And my mom taking me to the, the public library, and I would check out, uh, there was an author back then who wrote a lot of kids' books, uh, Daniel Cohen. And he wrote tons of kids' books on like paranormal subjects. And I think I devoured all of them. Um, And then growing up in the house, I grew up in downtown Richmond. And if you know anything about Richmond, Virginia, the South, you know, there's a ton of history here. I mean, we, we are, we are soaked in civil war history alone, just in the Richmond area. And um, the house I grew up in was built in 1898. Okay. Uh, we were the second more. family to live there, and my mother didn't sell that house till 2004, oh, wow. and there were only two families that lived in that house since it was built. Darn. And um, there was sporadic, I guess what people would call non-interactive or residual type activity there. Okay. Um, that I experienced some of that. My my father, who who was not a you know, he didn't disbelieve, but he was not really into this kind of stuff. He experienced quite a bit of it. Um, and then um, at one point when I was probably about 11 or 12, for no reason, to this day, I don't know why I saw this thing. But I, I saw a, a full shadow person, like head, arms, legs, in a place that had no reported activity. You know, and it took me by surprise. Um scared the crap out of me as a child yeah, um, sure. and um i always just wanted to know more mm-hmm. but just always wanted to know more now as a kid and you see these apparitions and you don't know what residual and intelligent mm-hmm. is then were you, did it terrify you seeing i didn't see anything or- in the house i grew up in okay. it was it was always audio Okay. It was, it was really, that was my dad did, my dad did. And my dad didn't, it didn't bother him in the slightest. Oh, wow. So, um, and so when I said, well, I heard this or I heard that, um, he'd be like, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. He didn't disbelieve me, but he was just like, it's nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And he was religious. Yeah. 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 Very much so. Very much so. Did your friends not want to come over to your house? (laughs) Some of my friends that knew about it thought it was kind of spooky. Yeah. Spooky. Uh, They pointed at your uh, house when they walked by. Mm -hmm. And it it, it probably didn't help that my father um, was was really into kind of that uh, late Victorian architecture. Oh, yeah. Nice. And and collected antiques. Uh, And so the front two rooms of this house were pretty much decorated circa 1910. Cool. That's a lot may have had an attachment if you believe in those. (laughs) Yeah, Brad, uh, is it Bradley, right? Brad, yeah. Yeah, he's he's Tyler. Yeah, and you know, you work with um, Steve Dills too, right? Some Um, some things. We are in completely different organizations that have very different approaches. Um, but, uh, I am very familiar with Steve. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I'd seen some photos with all you guys. Yeah. He's, he's a really good guy. He's a good friend of our, yep. our show and yep. Brad. <laughs> yep. And actually I have a question leading into what Bob has asked. So I'll ask Bob's question second, but, um, I'm really interested in talking to you. I love talking to, with Brad about this because I'm more into the scientific side of the the paranormal as well. And um, I would like to know what kind of equipment you guys use 
because I know we're in the process of doing one experiment and we're trying to get our hands on a mass spectrometer. But those aren't cheap. <laughs> the, the you cheap would love ones, one of those too. So uh. The cheap ones are missing the features that we need. But then in addition to what type of equipment you use, Bob wants to know what type of a camera equipment you use. Okay, um, so equipment. Uh, we'll start with cameras. Um, mm -hmm. Cameras, um, it's it's really just standard um, uh, digital video cameras. Um, nothing that's crazy, nothing's off the shelf. I mean, it does have IR floods built in so we can use them in a dark environment. Um, running to a, uh, you know, just a, a central hub. And and this is one thing with, with um, our methodology is we will set up equipment and we will be able to live monitor video and audio uh, depending on the equipment we might be able to in certain instances live monitor certain data uh, collection devices um, but mostly it's video audio and then we get the heck out of wherever we're at mm -hmm. um, we're not trying to contaminate it with our own electronic stuff from our cell phones and stuff in fact we're te we tell our teams leave your cell phone outside because your cell phone's constantly sending and receiving signals that can interfere with the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, but the cameras are, are pretty straightforward. Um, audio, we're using uh, DRO5s. Um, those are great. Um, we're also just using some standard, um, you know, like office style uh, audio recorders that we will use to supplement. Um, then we get into data collection stuff. We're using Geiger counters. Um, we are using um, a variety of um, uh, off-the-shelf data collection stuff. Like there's one, uh, Kenny Newsom, our, our, our tech guy, and one of our fellow board members. Um, he has a little pod because he's a, a high school science teacher. Mm. And you can... Uh, jack it into a laptop and you can take continuous environmental uh, sensor readings across whatever metrics you've set up the block for, right? Mm -hmm. um, normally, we're looking at things like temperature, humidity, uh, pressure, EMF, uh, magnetic field. Um, we may have a, a geophone or an accelerometer. And so you get the footsteps is something actually yeah. moving. Um, but it's all standard, really like, you know, high school, university science lab stuff. Um, none, of, none of the stuff that is, quote unquote, you know, ghost hunting equipment, if you will. The only thing that we do use that was made for the, 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 the paranormal community, if you will, uh, is an EDI. Mm -hmm. um, and those are great. Yeah. Um, now, people like to hold them and walk around and you're not supposed to do that, put them static. Um, but those are great, great. And, and the company that made them, and I'm sure Brad has talked about this. I'm, I'm almost certain I heard Brad talk about this. The company that made those, just like any other piece of equipment we have, we know how that equipment works. We know how it's supposed to perform. We know what its pluses are, its minuses are. Technically speaking, we understand it. Whereas there's a lot of the stuff that's being sold as quote unquote ghost hunting equipment. How does it work? Nobody knows. Nobody wants to tell you. Just buy my piece of equipment. Um, so it's, it's really basic stuff. Um, now, um, one thing that, that we have added is we have a couple members. Um, that have constructed their own equipment because like the EDI only has a sampling rate of once per second. Well, you may want to get much farther into that. You may want, you know, 50, 100, whatever um, samples per second. EDI doesn't do that. Certain other equipment will. So um, um, uh, Tommy Amos, who was one of our founders, um, helped uh, produced his own um, magnetic field sensors. Mm. And I think he is sampling at 50 or 100 wow. per second. Um, and he made them. Um, and then we have also augmented our video uh, in the last year or so with some software where we can 
load our video into this. And you figure man hour wise, if you set up 16 cameras, which is not uncommon, um, and you're in a location for eight hours, well, that's eight times 16. And that's a lot of video review. That yeah. is an awful lot of video review. Um, we can load our video now into the software package. Um, again, this is something Tommy helped develop um, where it will analyze the video and say, hey, at this timestamp, at this frame, you need to look at this. Mm. And the, the, the system may say, look at this. And it's, you know, it's nothing. Right. Yeah. It's nothing. In a couple of recent instances, we've been like, ooh, we would have never seen that. Mm -hmm. It might be a light anomaly that appears only briefly, like a second or two. Um, in one particular instance, we had kind of the shimmery, we call it almost the predator effect, right? Mm -hmm. Something that was, I mean, it couldn't have been bigger than like a softball or a grapefruit that moved up a set of stairs. But again, watching that with your naked eye for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, um, you, you're going to miss that. Scrolling. Like it. Um, and so, yeah, so that's really, that's our, a lot of our equipment set up right there. But also just getting out, just, just get out, sit back, watch and listen. You will, you will hear so much if you just get out and listen. Mm -hmm. You have a question? I do. I didn't know if you had one before I went on. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, this question was actually asked um, by Jessica watching my show, my Tuesday morning show. She wanted to know about the solfeggio frequencies. And we none of us knew about it yesterday on the show. And I did a little research today. So I kind of wanted to get your input on it. Have you guys heard about that? Have you worked with it? Jessica is clearly a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will um, have, I, I'm going to make a note of that. Yes, because uh -huh. the little bit of research that my uh, guest yesterday and one of our viewers did, it was um, certain frequencies that have been known to elevate your energy, to summon demons, to, mm -hmm. um, you know, interact with the spirits and all of that no that would that would definitely be going in a in a direction that is opposite of how we right. okay yeah i just wasn't sure if it had any scientific backing to it i wonder what the frequency is i mean you know, you know the schumann resonance is a certain frequency and all uh infrasound is a certain frequency so i wonder what that. And I'm curious if that's what she's talking about. Is yeah, is, she had mentioned it. during the show in follow up comments that it was um, used in some music as well. Something that could stimulate the familiar with that. lobes or something. I don't know. Interesting. So, uh, thank you to Jessica for uh, I mean, that is uh, now I have something to go look up. <laughs> yeah, Your homework she has assignment. us researching it too, trying to figure it uh, out and how we could use it. Yeah, tell me when you when you find out. Just send me the information. Okay, and then uh, Chrissy wants to know how long have you been investigating? Seventeen years, seventeen years. So actually, going into my eighteenth now. Hey, Courtney. Um, yep. So I want to get to the elephant in the room about <laughs> law enforcement and your coworkers and peers in. The police department know you were out there investigating paranormal situations. So what kind of atmosphere did that create with you at, at your work? Or did they even know? I mean, I would assume, you know, um, like you were hiding it or anything. I would no, I, did, I, I don't, I don't know that I particularly early on, I, I don't think I advertised it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, didn't shy away from it. I didn't like hide it or anything. And, you know, you get, you get the ribbing that, but you know, if, if as a cop and I think firefighters and military yeah. people in the same way, if, if somebody's not, you know, busting your chops over something, they don't like you. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, you get some good natured ribbing, but by and large, most of the people I worked with, um, either at my agency or other agencies, and I worked a lot with other agencies. Uh -huh. Um, 
they were actually really interested. Yeah. They're actually really interested. And we have, we actually have one other retired cop and another active duty cop that is part of uh, CPRI right now. Oh, nice. Did you ever, I mean, in that line of work, just like with paramedics and ER people, they sometimes can have unexplainable occurrences happen and they have no one to talk to. Did you ever have any of your coworkers like say, hey, Alan, can I, can I talk to you about something that happened that, while I was out on this call and, you know, didn't want it known, but, you know, knew they could confide in you and you not think they're crazy. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you'd be surprised how many cops actually see and experience yeah. weird stuff on the job. They have to. <laughs> and I've had them come to me. Um, I, I had a, a pretty close buddy of mine who responded to, uh, I think it was a homicide scene one night. And he said it was snowing on the ground. And a guy met him out front. And he said the guy didn't say anything. He realized that after the fact, but but was telling him to come around back. And he got around back and the guy was gone. And then he realized there was no footprints other than his own. Oh, wow. That's in the cool. snow. And he said that was unnerving. Um, but you, you'd be surprised. I mean, they, they, they talk about it readily. They may not talk about it to you know the general public. Yeah. But um, amongst each other. Oh, yeah. They talk about it. And they, and they they experience things. I bet you there's some remarkable stories that if you could ever get it. Well, um, one of our members, the, the one that is currently active duty uh, law enforcement, uh, he wrote a book on it because um, he um, at one point in his career was a police officer for um, the Virginia State Capitol. What's his name? Paul Hope. Did we not? Paul Hope, he wrote a book called uh, "Policing the Paranormal." Yeah, okay. I'm, and yeah. and he he's a he's a member of ours, and uh, he wrote that book about uh, paranormal experiences um, that he and other members um, uh, of the Capitol Police Department mm. experienced down there. Well, there's so a he was very open. Um, paranormal 911 that kind of deals with this subject of Yeah, I love uh, that uh, that is one of the shows that I that I do enjoy. Um, yeah, I'm sure uh, they embellish a lot, but the basis of a lot of the stories <laughs> are Excuse me. Um yeah, they do, but I enjoy that show because I I think sometimes first responders are in a yeah. unique position that we can see some stuff that maybe people don't yeah, my niece is a paramedic, and she had to go to a nursing home and pick up a, a, a deceased person. And she said the rocking chair was just a rocking with a doll in it. And she said she just like, nope, <laughs> got the body and got out. I get it. Yeah. We do have a lot of questions that are starting to flood in. So oh, thank you, everyone, for asking good. questions. Nicole's first question is, what's your favorite location so far? Mm. That is a harder question than you might think. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> they all have their own personalities in different places. It, it depends on, I, I guess I look at it like, because it's, it's, it's almost like, like pick your favorite movie, which is impossible. Your favorite child, yeah. Um, I, that's what I always say. It's like picking your favorite child. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I can't. There are places that I like for different reasons. So Bacon's Castle, for example, is probably a favorite. Mm -hmm. Not in so much as that, like the the activity there is so dramatic, or there's a creep factor, or any you know, it, it it it's that one. I'm a history nerd. I love history stuff. So I love going to these historic properties. Yes not having to be surrounded by tourists and a lot of staff and just being able to enjoy the history of the place totally separate from you know any of the paranormal stuff right um and we've been conducting research at bacon's castle for 12 years now and it is really the probably at this point the preeminent laboratory environment for cpri that we got and, and we have a couple more that we've been building up, but Bacon's is the longest. And Bacon's is, the activity there is 
consistent, repeatable for the entire time that mm -hmm. we've been there. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I love it. I love the property. I love what we've been able to do with it as an organization. Um, it, it's, it's wonderful. Now, shift gears, um, a, a property that I find very, very, very interesting um, is uh, St. Albans. Oh, yeah. I think St. Albans Sanatorium, also in Virginia, um, is very, very interesting. Um, it is also one of the few places that actually creeps me out. Um, and um, the, the activity there is just different. Um, the types of things that we've encountered there are just different. Mm. Um, and the, 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 the place can either be on or off, you know, oh, yeah. if it's on, it's on, and if it's off, it's off. Um, but, uh, I, I, I just, I'm fascinated with, with some of the stuff that we've run across there. Um, so yeah, that's, I, again, a lot harder question than I, I would have thought. Uh, <laughs> but just uh, for our viewers, your team doesn't do residential investigations. We used to. Yeah. And if if something comes down the pike, uh -huh. um, we will get involved. Um, but by and large, we don't seek them. We don't ask for them. Um, we're certainly happy to help people as we can, but we make it very clear that we are not ghostbusters we are not paranormal eliminators uh -huh. we are not going to come in and you know validate you as soon as we walk through the door we're yep. going to be very skeptical and thoughtful in our approach um and you know of course residential investigations come with their own set of potential pitfalls yes um that being said uh we've done them we've done them you know <sighs> Just in the last few years, we've, we've done a couple, um, but um, we really try not to um, yeah. because we want that long term data. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're just not going to get it from a lot of no. residential environments. You're not because, you know, you how do you go in and you kick everybody out of the house and how do you know when it's going to be available? And, you know, th there's so many variables there, whereas these historic sites they're not residences, you know, they close at a certain time, people leave them, you know, um, and you can get them almost any time. So it's a much better lab for us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark says he needs to join you guys as soon so he can bring the touchy feely aspect into the investigation. <laughs> I love Mark. I love Mark. He has a few other fun comments later on that we'll get to. Oh, just a minute. God. God help and, me. And then Brad wants to know about your special office at the battlefield you investigated. Oh, God. That's a <laughs> good one. Spill the beans. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That that would be uh, apparently I'm assigned to the Porta John. Uh, <laughs> toilet, rather. Very active, huh? Um, the pit toilet at a particular battlefield location that uh that we've been working on for the last couple of years yeah and that's apparently a per the chief ranger <laughs> okay and then courtney wants to know are there any keywords or tips to communicate to law enforcement to pay attention to you regarding the paranormal and cold cases any tips to communicate to law enforcement to pay attention I, 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 if I understand correctly, she's asking how to get law enforcement to listen to her and she has information. And not thinks they're, that she's crazy because of right. the information she had. You know, the skeptic, you know. That's tough. Um, yeah. She says yes, that's exactly what she's asking. Yeah. Uh -huh. They're okay. either going to believe in it to begin with and would look towards that as a possible avenue or they're just not i would i would i think there'd have to be open-mindedness there I, I i guess it would depend on how it was phrased mm -hmm. so no if, if you're calling in the information like like say through an anonymous crime stoppers line yeah. or something like that and you're saying i think 
that, you know, this clue, for lack of a better term, yeah. is here. Um, and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. and, and see if they follow up on it. Um, right. When you call and go, well, I'm a psychic. Yeah. And I think that, you know, whatever. The person on the other end of the line may be like, mm, okay, yeah. thanks for calling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and how do you do it without becoming a suspect? Well, I check your alibi. <laughs> <laughs> Have one before you call that night of whatever happened. Happened. I, I, I mean, there. I think there's some, and I haven't really read up on these types of cases uh, before, uh, but I, I, I think there are instances where um, people that that may be gifted have been able to contribute somehow uh, to a case. But <clears throat> excuse me. At the same time, you got to be able to present this in court too. Yeah. So, you know, the, the psychic alone is not going to do it. And Anton, thank you for watching. He's a regular watcher of ours. He wants to know if you or your group have done any work in the ultraviolet spectrum. Not that I can immediately recall. And I'm assuming he's talking about for like still photography. Um, I think so. I, I know we have a couple members that have played around with it some, but as, as a standard investigative tool, we have not used that yet. Um, we have used thermal, but not UV. Yeah, I've wanted to try ultraviolet um, slow shutter speed photography, but those cameras are not cheap, you know, so that's not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> you, you know, and in 17 years, of, of doing this i think we've caught stuff on video half a dozen times maybe. yeah maybe yep. and i can tell you that that um oh Rob, of course brad's <laughs> correcting me sorry brad and he uh, said yes for video and photography is what he wanted to know Sorry, Brad. Brad, see, Brad. Brad's just Brad's here supervising me to make sure I don't get into trouble. And does that ult, um, uh, full spectrum light have ultraviolet with it? Yeah. Um, I would think. Full spectrum will, yes. Yeah, yeah, because we use full spectrum lights on some of our cameras, our night vision cameras. And they have yeah, ultraviolet. but but again, by and large, like I, I think we've caught something on video half a dozen times. Mm -hmm. Um. And I can tell you personally with my own eyes doing this, I've seen something that like three, four yeah. pops. Brad, Brad, see. Brad's like Brad's like one of the Muppets in the balcony. That's, that's what he's doing. <laughs> Bring on the frog. Have you ever been touched? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not how, do you measure, how do you measure that scientifically? <laughs> we we did. We yeah. did. We had we had a um we had uh, oddly enough a, a who a gentleman who at the time was a, a new member. And we were at a historic site and suddenly and he didn't believe in it. You know, he went into this going, This is all explainable. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I, I'm you know, this is this is all explainable. He was interested, but yeah. but he he took a very 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 hard line, and all of a sudden he was getting touched all <laughs> over, and, and and Brad was laughing his rear end off um, because you know he looks like you know he's getting he's, attacked by bees or something. Yeah, getting attacked by bees or something, <laughs> and they did have the wherewithal to 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 put a. Um, uh, uh, a, a laser thermometer on him, uh, and and they saw the the the, the temperature drop. <laughs> so that was that was funny because he didn't did believe he, anything. Did he ever come back? <laughs> yeah, no, no. He's 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 a very active member. Of okay, all good. <laughs> did scare him off. Uh, but it, it it sure freaked him out because <laughs> he did not expect that. 
He did not believe that was possible. And they knew it when he walked in the door. <laughs> yeah, I always say the best moment in this field is when a skeptic becomes a believer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and Brad was one of those people, too. So yeah. um, it's all fun and games till something flies at you in a hallway. <laughs> um, Bob wants to know, do you ever feel like you're missing out on investigation methods by omitting religion and what that involves as far as the paranormal goes? Personally, no, no, I don't. Um, that's not to say that I don't personally think that there might be a place for that. Um, but then it begs the the philosophical question of what religion? My religion, your religion, somebody else's religion. Um, you know. Um, and, you know, the thing is, our goal is to be able to collect data that could be presented to the mainstream academic community. You know, your normal scientists, right? I mean, there, there it goes. Follow the data. Brad, I see Brad chiming in now. The, um, be able to present that data, you know, to, to people that are outside of this. You know, that, that maybe have no interest in this, to think this is a, you know, a ton of crap, right? And be able to say, this is what the data says, right? It, it's like as a, as a police officer going into court, okay? I may think that so-and-so committed the crime, right? What I think, what I believe, doesn't matter. The fact pattern matters. The evidence matters. Like Brad said, follow the data. That matters. What I believe, the, the, my personal feelings, they're not relevant. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's why we approach it the way that we do. Again, that's not to say that there's not a place for uh, religion or the, the, the metaphysical, for example. Um, but it's, it's just not what we do. It's not our organizational goal, um, you know, and, and there may be something to that. I, I don't know. I mean, you, you that's a mighty big rabbit hole to go down. And it um, really is belief dependent. A question. Now, the the long term facility that you investigated you said, was the castle, I think you said. Bacon's Castle. Yes. Um, Located in Surrey, Virginia. So what data have you found has been the most What's happened consistently when a paranormal occurrence has happened? Is it temperature, humidity, pressure? What one thing has really stood out that seems to be consistent when uh, something happens? So time and time again, we found that there are environmental changes yeah. that um, are simultaneous to an anomalous event. You know, the, the footsteps in the hallway, if you will, right? And we talk about these in terms of being micro events. Uh -huh. Okay. So um, a micro event, meaning that you have that uh, footsteps in the hallway, right? Yeah. But the sensors, the data collecting sensors are data loggers. They are only going to detect it if it's within really a couple feet of whatever the point of origin is, right? Yeah. It's across the room. The data loggers aren't going to register it. It's very, very, very isolated, right? And we're finding that um, there are um, uh, spikes in EMF along with changes in temperature. Uh -huh. um, and um, in cases of interactive activity, for example, or, or correction, seemingly interactive activity we will have uh, spikes in ionizing radiation. Yes. Along with changes in shifts in all three axes of the magnetic field. Uh -huh. That doesn't happen with the non-interactive stuff, which is weird. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and we don't know why. 
And, and we don't talk about things in terms of being residual or intelligent. We just say seemingly non-interactive, seemingly interactive. So interactive would be the door knob latch turns and the door opens and the door shuts, right? That's interactive. It's acting yeah. upon an object, right? And the non-interactive is the, you know, the disembodied footsteps in the hallway. Um, and you will get... Um, the, the spikes in ionizing radiation. Why? I I don't know. Again, I'm a humanities guy, and 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 uh, Brad and I like to go back and forth <laughs> over that all the time. Um, I'm an observational guy. Um, we have had one instance at Bacon's Castle where we had basically what amounted to an uh, electromagnetic pulse knocked out all the equipment in this particular oh, yeah. area in front of a door that has been known to open and close by itself with this heavy latch turn, this heavy brass latch turning because it's, you, you can't open it any other way. Thank you, Brad. Uh, <laughs> um, about EMF spikes, when you see consistently EMF spikes for an occurrence, are they huge spikes or what What range are they? Is there, I, I mean, that is there now you're always looking for the giant jump? But it doesn't. It, it may not be a giant jump. It yeah. could be a giant jump. Yeah. Um, but it, it may just be a noticeable spike above the mean. You know, yeah. you have all this slide. We're going and we're going and, you know, yeah. And then it's back down again. <laughs> um, but that has been consistent over time, uh -huh. those environmental changes. It's been noted time and time and time again. And then you have those, those weird, uh, uh, you know, kind of outliers like like the EMF uh, or EMP, basically at Bacon's Castle, we had an ionizing radiation uh, spike of. I uh, know he's watching; he's going to correct me. It was over one hundred and fifty counts per minute. Wow! I want to say, which is freaking ridiculous. Yeah. At at an, this was another historic location. It was, and again, it's not something that lasted. It was up and down. But, you know, you look at a Geiger counter and the background radiation here is 20 ish yeah, yeah. counts per minute somewhere in there. That ballpark. Oh, excuse me. 257. God, I mean, that's good radiation. That's, burns right. Yeah. There. You, I mean, that should have fried you. Right. Yeah. What what causes that? Well, a nuclear blast. But well, we didn't have one of those. Yeah. You know, in, in the middle. Oh, of the well. um, so why? Why does that happen? I mean, some of that stuff, like the, the 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 spikes in ionizing radiation, the shifts in magnetic field, as an organization, we think that that is indicative to some of the theoretical discussions uh, surrounding uh, uh, wormholes, Einstein Rosenbridge, yeah, and that perhaps that might be what is causing what we perceive as haunting phenomena, you know. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not actually experiencing the ghost of Uncle Bob. Yeah. You know, but maybe a voice or an image is coming through a wormhole in space time. I'm hearing a sound. That sound is real. Yeah. It's just not occurring in the same space time I am in. But I'm able to register it on my side. Where do you put EVPs in all your data collecting? Because I know if with your digital recorders, you're bound to have captured unexplained voices, I would think. We, we capture a lot of audio. A yeah, lot of audio. Um, and one thing we don't do is we don't try to, one, we, we don't try to engage with anything. Mm -hmm. So we don't go into a property and say, is there anybody here that want yeah. to talk to us or anything like that? We don't do that at all. We are entirely passive. Uh -huh. um, we, we make no effort to interact with anything. Um, also, when we get a voice, for example, if we think it's a voice, yeah, um, we don't try to sit there and decipher what it's saying. Uh -huh. We just go, that's a voice. Sounds like a woman. Yeah. And we move on. Um, we move on. Um, but you'll get a lot of stuff like you get a lot of noises that <coughs> are are not necessarily voices. You you get voices, you'll get yeah. footsteps, you'll get bangs, 
uh, you, uh, one, one noise that seems to you, you seem to hear all the time is like the woo <laughs> yeah. variations on that. Um, but um, no, again, we're not trying to to interact, and um, we're also looking to say, hey, we got that voice. <clears throat> Did we get anything on a data logger simultaneous to that that voice, that yeah. noise, whatever it was? I you said we got tons of questions because I can just think, you know. So go ahead. <laughs> I'm comfortable. I'm drinking my good rye. <laughs> uh, and I'm on mute. Go figure. Um, <laughs> there was one question that I lost somewhere in the things and I untagged it, but it was from Anthony. He wanted to know, going back to um, uh, fellow uh, law enforcement co-workers, did anyone admit after the fact that they might have encountered a shadow person? Um, not a shadow person. Oh, well. I had a coworker, this was a very long time ago, um, who told me they witnessed a fully cloaked figure. Uh, at the time I worked as a police officer for Virginia Commonwealth University and we were on midnight shift. So there was some weirdness on midnight shift, <laughs> not just the officers. Um, but the, she told me she witnessed a, a cloaked figure that's how she described it. That's a good one. Cross an area of campus called the Compass. It's kind of like where three streets come together, and it's got this elaborate compass mosaic brick in there. And saw this figure cross it and kind of was really taken aback and then went to the end of the street to say, you know, where, where did this thing go? And nothing was there. So did she see something? I'm sure she saw something, but, you know, it was midnight shift in downtown Richmond. So all kinds of weirdness going on. So was it paranormal? I have no idea. Yeah. As far as shadow people specifically, that's about as close as I've heard anybody talk. And then Mark wants to know, uh, Michi Tavern had good chicken, right? I'm a barbecue person. so <laughs> Yeah. Love I normally get the barbecue when I go there. Um, and then, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Anthony, um, I might need you to clarify this. I'm assuming you mean ley line. I'm not sure. Um, how many places have you visited that was on a way line? But I'm thinking that might be yeah. ley line. I don't, I, I think he means ley line. I agree. Um, we haven't checked. We haven't checked. Um, uh, that's, that's not one of the, the things we have been looking at. Mm. Um, now I will toss out another area of um, uh, of environmental data, uh -huh. and this is something that that uh, Brad, uh, research coordinator, had noted some years ago, and that's the GOES satellite data. Say that again. GOES satellite data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is one of several satellites um, operated by NOAA. Oh yeah, it's yeah. just a it's just a space weather satellite, right? Yeah, I get there. Measuring fluctuations in the magnetic field around the Earth, and you can go on to NOAA's website. And you can look at all of their satellite data, twenty four hours a day if, if that's what you're into. And um, there's a GOES satellite um, that's roughly over the East Coast, and the magnetic field data goes up and down all day long 24 hours a day 365 this is going up and down right well one thing we noticed was a correlation that when the the goes data is on the downward slope mm -hmm. we are having activity mm -hmm. on the down for that slope the activity may be more pronounced mm -hmm. when it bottoms out starts to go back up again it's quiet and time and time and time again to the point where and and again this was a few years back uh, four or five years back we stopped looking at GOES satellite data until long after 
Like if, if we did a, a, a research project on Saturday, uh -huh. we wouldn't look at the go satellite data from that night for another couple of days uh -huh. because we don't want to bias anything uh -huh. we're doing that particular night. Right. Um, and um, it's correlated time and time and time again, which tells us once again, there is an environmental factor uh -huh. in play. We don't fully understand what that factor is, but there is an environmental factor in play and it's predictable and it's repeating. Do you um, collect geological data for your locations? We have, we have. Um, I'd love to see us do more on that, but yes, we have. Because, you know, we wonder what's beneath the building, what part it plays and what goes on in the building. Somehow. We've had a lot of conversations amongst ourselves as yeah. to what may or may not be in play in there. And a lot of that, I think, it still resides very firmly within the realm of the theoretical. Do you um, take note of any bodies of water or anything near location just for reference you do you do yeah. but i mean does that have an effect on what's going on we don't know yeah um there's a, there's you know those folks that say like water mm -hmm. uh limestone for example yeah. could could affect activity um towards you know, copper and all this yeah you know, do we know? We don't know. Um, you know, there might be merit to that. But there's just not been enough research into that. Yeah. And and as good of our as our equipment is, I mean, we we still need. We'd love that spectrometer. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple theories that we want to test, but we want to get our hands on it first. So it's. I, I'm getting close to being brave enough to ask the local university if we can partner with them. Oh, that is brave. Oh. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. because I have no idea where I mean they have handheld ones but they don't do all of what we're looking for we're we're looking for the full full lineup of what's in the you know the chemicals in the air mm. I, I'm trying to remember what it was that that Brad wanted um, it was a it was a again humanity social sciences. Um, it was something to take air samples mm, yes. and analyze air samples because, for example, um, at Bacon's Castle, one of the things that occurs there from time to time is this pronounced uh, scent of lavender, right? Mm -hmm. And it yeah. will be stationary uh -huh. and you can literally step into it and out of it. Uh -huh. And it may only last, you know, a few seconds and be very limited as, as you know, where it is. But he has this idea of going in and, you know, being able to collect an air sample if that happens, right? Mm -hmm. And say, yep. are we really smelling something? Is there something there to smell? Yep, that's yeah. definitely similar to what we're, and it was funny, it came to me in a dream and I woke up and I was like writing it down and my husband who is my on my team with me, He's like, he goes, that, will you know, it's one of those that will never work, but then again, and it might work. And he's like, and how the heck are you going to get your hands on one of those? To <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I mean, it, apparently it's expensive. I'm mm -hmm. Very expensive. Yeah. Now, at, at first, a like, the Google C3, search, they were like, I was like, oh, $200. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, as, and, and as a 501c3, we do accept donations of, uh, of cash or equipment. Yeah. It, it is yeah. tax deductible. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, and Brett, I see you. I actually have you on my list. I will reach out to you tomorrow because um, I might be able to help and offer at least Aha. maybe you could answer some of my questions or I might be able to give you some other ideas for that as well. Okay. Excellent. And Anthony wants to know, so your group rules out human activities over spirit activities. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Yeah, that yeah. one's. Can I'm looking to see if he up? commented anywhere else afterwards. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm thinking he's uh, human contamination. 
over spirit like you rule that out but i'm not sure so anthony if you're still watching can you please help clarify yeah, that one a little bit more and then tiffany wants to know do you find it hard to get a historic place to allow your team to investigate it seems more harder in the south yeah it's that is an excellent question um there are Properties that, that we will conduct research at that will not allow other paranormal uh, groups to go into. Um, and, and I say that as just a point of fact. I'm not saying that to say, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're this, we're, you know, we're wonderful. I'm not, I'm not saying it, it as a, as a brag, if you will. I'm not trying to boast um but there are a number of properties that we're in historic properties historic locations they're not going to let any other group come on there um and i think one of the reasons that that we have been so successful with that is one time right you know you get into to uh one place for example and that may open a door to another place we have built over um the course of well over 12 years at this point probably pushing 15 with some of the other properties uh relationship with preservation virginia um which um manages a great many of the historic properties in virginia and they have to get to where they can trust you because when you come to them and you say, hey, we want to come in here and do, you know, paranormal investigation. OK, they're immediately going to go to the, the, the travel channel version of what the, the YouTube version of what paranormal investigations are. Right. Um, and we had to show them that we weren't that right. We're not. We're not coming in here to do anything that would be disrespectful to or even be perceived as disrespectful to your site. We are going to leave your site at least as good, if not better than we found it. Um, we're not going to go in there and do anything we're like, like we're not trying to engage with anything. And that's been a selling point with mm -hmm. historic properties is not engaging with them. Our passive approach has been a big selling point to, to uh, these organizations. Right. Um, the um, fact that we will, we tell them we're looking for quantifiable data we're not going to run away and never show you that data. On the contrary, we will give you a full report, written report of our findings that you can do with whatever you want. Um, and then that has helped, all of this has helped build trust um, over time and help, I, I like to think, give us a really good reputation as coming in and being uh, very professional in, in how we do what we do um, because that, that, that trust is just vital to getting into some of these locations, just vital um, because a lot of them, they don't want it. They don't want the hype. They don't want uh, the reputation. Pardon? The reputation. Some of them don't. And, and that's very true. There's a couple properties that, that we're involved with that they don't want that. They don't want ghost hunters there. They don't want uh, the, the reputation of that, you know. But in a case like Bacon's Castle, for example, and I, I continue to go back to that, um, they've had reports of paranormal activity there that go back two and three centuries, right? Yeah. So they're okay with that. That property is okay with that. And then we turn around and um, at least once a year, uh, we uh, go down, we set up our equipment, and they do uh, historic slash ghost tours down there in October. Uh -huh. And we volunteer our time, and we uh, go down there, and we set up our stuff, and they're collecting all the money for it. We don't make a dime. And I like to think that we're part of the draw, 
and that's their biggest fundraiser for the year. Nice. Um, and again, we're not trying to make it spooky or, you know, it, it, I mean, we would be the most boring reality show <laughs> on, on television because we're not going for that kind of the, the, the spooky angle, if you will. Um, but we walk people through and we explain, you know, the science of what we're doing. We explain the equipment that we're using. Uh, we talk about our findings there. And then at Bacon's and I think a couple other properties, our people have even uh, volunteered to get trained as historic docents for the property, too, to help give back. Um, so it's really about relationship building and just being, you know, as as honest and, and professional as you can be. And then, of course, we, we you know, being a 501c3 really helped and, mm -hmm. and being insured has really helped. Having liability insurance. At the end of the day, though, do some of these places come to you and say, so do you think our building's haunted or not? <laughs> um, they, they, some will say, oh, I don't care what you say. It's, it's, it, it's haunted. Some yeah. Will, yeah. So, I mean, depends on, you know, who you're dealing with and, and who's in charge. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the battlefield that, that, um, Brad referred to earlier. Um, I, I'm friends with the chief ranger there. Um, he, for example, I don't think he believes, but I don't think he disbelieves. He's experienced stuff himself out there, but he's very nonchalant about it. It's not kind of on his radar. He thinks it's curious and he wants to know more, but, you know, he's not, uh, you know, a diehard. Not curious so, enough to pursue um, it, I guess. Yeah. Right. Um, but so to, to answer her question, it's really, you know, just about building those relationships, building that trust and, yeah. and being able to demonstrate that you and your organization are are worthy of that trust. And some teams that don't behave themselves can ruin it for a lot of other people, too. That's one big problem. No, and, and so. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to climb up on my soapbox here <laughs> and um there are a lot of teams and and, and I, I i i hate to say that because this is gonna again this is gonna come off wrong and it's probably gonna rub some people the wrong way but there are a lot of teams that are really seat of their pants irresponsible in, in yeah. some of, of their dealings and mm -hmm. i'll give you a case in point um we got a a, a help request from an individual in uh rural county outside of the Richmond area. This was probably about five, six years ago. And the individual um, was convinced that he was under demonic oppression. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a couple lengthy phone calls with him in advance of going out and did a lot of Q&A with him before we said we were going to willing to go out. Well, one of the things I asked him about was his medical history and his psych history. And um, he had had um, a major head injury. He had a couple major head injuries. Um, and um, he had some psychiatric problems. Now, what came first, the chicken or the egg, because he yeah. had serious head trauma? Um, I don't know. Um, we brad and i actually went out and, and did the initial visit and the guy's telling us you know i i i I'm, I'm pretty sure i'm under demonic oppression and he's saying this and that and the other his wife's sitting there the whole time doesn't say a word she's just just sitting there didn't say anything and um he said yeah i had this group that came in from another part of the state uh, and they set up a camera and they told me not only was my house was haunted, but there were demons in my house. And, and they gave me video of the demons. And I said, um, okay, can, can may, may we see the video? Yeah, 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 it's right here. And, you know, he pulls up uh, the, the, the screen. And they basically basically put a camera on the floor of his bedroom. And, and this um, with the IR flood on it. And it's just a shower of dust bunnies yeah. on his bed. 
He's like, see that? See, those are the demons. Those are the uh, demons. The demons are it's 100%. The man was sincere in his boy. <laughs> and I said, okay. And and the, the group that did this, this paranormal group, uh-huh. did it. They just left. They thought sure. it, they had a banger of a night and they just went home. Right. And I said, well, certainly, you know, you're on any medications. Can I see your medications? He shows me your medications. And I'm like, hmm, I think that one is, that's a mental health med. Let me. Yeah. Well, we have an MD on staff. So I called up the MD. I stepped out. I called the MD. And I said, uh, hey, he's taking this. He goes, oh, that's a. Uh, that's a pretty powerful antipsychotic. Psychotic, yeah. Right. And um, so I said, okay, thanks. Appreciate it. And and I I then I do the the, the cop thing, which is the you know, separate the suspects, separate the witnesses. Mm-hmm. And I asked the wife, hey, would you mind talking to me outside? Can we can we talk one on one a little bit? And sure, and we got I said, Are you seeing any of this? Yeah. Are you experiencing any of this? Yeah. What do you think? I think something's wrong. I think something's wrong with me. I want him to get help. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we were very candid and, and we went and we did our best to, you know, get him pointed towards medical intervention. But the, the moral of the story was you had a group that came in. And had took somebody who who clearly had you know medical issues, Reality, yeah. issues um, and, and and validated basically what was psychosis, mm-hmm. validated for it. What had happened if he had gone out and harmed himself or harmed somebody else? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're just I'm sure they were laughing all the way back to you know where they came from, and mm-hmm. they'd had a you know a kick ass night. That's the problem. You responsible. Yeah. And and I would be lying if I said I've I, I had not seen groups that pro- not that severe, but but have not been as responsible, respectful, and professional as 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 I personally yeah. think that we should be doing. I mean, what do, why are we in this field? Are we in this field? Because um, it's thrilling. Well, it can be, but a lot of times it's boring. Yeah. Right? You're sitting around mm-hmm. for hours on end with nothing happening, freezing or burning up. Yeah. Right. Are we in this field for, you know, to be paranormal famous, to be internet famous? Well, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of us that a are. Lot. Yeah. It's all about, about the likes. People. Not the quality, yeah. You know that want to, you know, that they want to be paranormal famous. Um, or are we in this because we have a genuine interest in this phenomena, if you will, and trying to understand it and trying to make the rest of the world, the the, the normals out there, the, the the your traditional scientific community, your traditional academics go. Holy shit! Pardon my language. You know, it, it, uh, holy shit! Th- these these yahoos just found something that, that we really need to look at. Yeah, something's going on here. So, I mean, are we into it for discovery? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, I I'm into it for discovery. Personally, my path may not be your path, may not be your path. You know, but. I just, I want to know. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think if, 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 again, it sounds boastful and I'm not saying it like that. I'm not trying to disparage other groups that have different approaches. I'm not. Um, but, you know, I think if more people took an approach that was closer to that, we might get a little further as a field of study. Mm-hmm. That's what we've been trying to do since 2020 with this this show. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so. Sure. 
Okay. And Anthony did comment back. He did say, yes, he meant human contamination. So do you rule that out? Yes, we do everything possible to rule that out. Yes, yes. Um, and there's some ways to do that um, is basically knowing whose voice is whose uh -huh. on, on the tape when you go in, not whispering, talking a normal voice. Um, and when we set out outside, um, again, we're getting outside of the location. We're trying not to contaminate the location. <clears throat> we're also keeping a log. Okay. So atomic clock says this at this time, I heard a bang. I heard a footstep timestamp timestamp. Okay. Somebody's going inside to either conduct some observations or to adjust some equipment. So Alan, Brad and Aaron went inside at this time. They came outside at this time. And that log is entered into the uh, permanent record of the case. And we maintain an RMS data repository of all of our cases. Okay. It's also very important to tag your stomach growling for audio. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. 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 The beast of sound the castle, we've called horrendous. it. <laughs> On audio. Yep, yep. <laughs> Nicole wants to know, have you guys tried the EVP Estes method? No, we have not. We have not. That would be engaging. Mm hmm I, 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 I'm, I am both curious and skeptical. Um, but then again, also we get into the, how do we quantify that? Right. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we truly know that it's working? Right. That method's so flawed because no one can hear the audio except for the one with the headphones on. How, how do you know it's working? What is what is your <laughs> benchmark for measurement? Yeah, how mm -hmm. do you know it's not pre-planned, the questions and the answers? Right, and and that's what I mean by like, you know, if, if that's your thing, by all means, mm. go do it. But it doesn't fit our model because we want something we can measure and hold up as a data point and go, aha, aha. Mm -hmm. There, there's a data point here, and I, we can't do that with Estes. Right. Okay. And then Bob wants to know, so you've never tried to have a conversation with the spirit? No. No. Not not, not in recent years. No. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did you, this one, um, Anthony asked, do you need to put in paperwork to tell law enforcement that you'll be exploring... Um, this band, band building, I'm thinking he meant abandoned building. Um, well, if, if, if you don't have permission in advance to be there, it's trespassing period. Yes. And that is a jailable offense in Virginia. So retired police officer or not, if you're trespassing, you're trespassing. <laughs> yeah. So no, we would have to have, uh, uh, permission in advance. And Anthony, don't you ever do that yourself? Mm -hmm. and never go alone yep and then he wants to know does your group open spirit doorways so spirits can travel no that that is that that i i i couldn't prove that a spirit doorway existed so you're not opening any portals huh <laughs> <laughs> and then his final question that he had asked is have at any time on a ghost hunt have you felt sick the minute you walk into a room there have been times where um, you, you definitely get a physical reaction um, to, to certain environments. Now, does that physical reaction mean that something paranormal is causing it? No. We have a member, um, uh, who, oddly enough, works around electricity, which is bizarre because he has a uh, extreme sensitivity to EMF, mm -hmm. uh, high EMF environments, which can occur absent ghosts, right? Mm -hmm. You know, or ghosts, um, <clears throat> make him ill. I mean, basically give him the equivalent of a migraine, headache, and nausea. Um, and it is purely EMF, high EMF exposure. He gets sick. Well, we know that EMF can do that. And mm -hmm. he's just one of those few people that it it really, really bothers. You have to get him 
out of an area. And so, you know, like a large you know, breaker box kind of thing that's just yeah. hooked in with EMF. If he stands near it, he'll get ill. He'll fall out. And that's why when we do residential investigations, we really go through the house checking for EMF hotspots because that could be causing what they think is paranormal if they're exposed to that long term, yes. like sleeping. Yes on the opposite side of their right. electrical panel with bad wiring and they're having all these symptoms. That's, that's the best use of a K2 meter is looking for wiring. Oh, we use the mail and then we, ha we have, you know, um, three axis, tri axis. Um, tri fuel meter. Yeah. Tri um, the, um, actually, a, a, an electrician's EMF detector with the you know, gets it from three directions. So, yeah, yeah I've mean, had those I things where I right sleep at night, and you know, I wake up and the ghost is in the room with me. And you go check the head of the bed, and there's, you know, like uh -huh. it's a giant EMF field from yeah. a poorly insulated, old or wiring. And you're like, hey, try moving your bed to the other side of the room, and they're like, oh, the ghost is gone. Yeah. And I'll tell you, those old timey alarm clocks, you know, with the numbers flipping. Oh, it's like sleeping next to. It's like sleeping line. next to an uh, EMF landmine. Those yeah. things are crank. We had that came yes. around yes. that about a year ago. I said, oh my God. And we showed her the video. I said, you yes. have got to throw this in the trash right now. I said, yes. Yes. It was, in it fact, was like terrifying. That, that, that guy that, that, um, I mentioned on the uh, that, that was on the antipsychotic medication. He slept next to one of those old alarm uh, clocks that was just blasting EMF. He space heaters are like, really bad for that. If you have a space heater near your bed, they have extremely high EMF. Yeah, yeah. And also, do not charge your cell phone at the head of your bed next to your head. There's so much radiation <laughs> coming off that thing; it can fry you too. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yes, the answer is yes, we've had that, but can we say that it was paranormal? Yeah. Okay. And Nicole wants to know if you've had any UFO encounters. Oh. I okay, so this is an area <laughs> that I am at not everybody in our group is into it. Um I I am super, super interested in that phenomena. And before I shuffle off this mortal coil, mm -hmm. I want to see one. I have never seen one. I am fascinated with this phenomena. I read everything I can get my paws on with the UFO phenomena. The last five, six years with some of the disclosure and yeah. what has been going on has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I devour it. I love it. I'm fascinated with it. And I think there's a possibility that all of this stuff that we categorize as ghosts mm -hmm. or UFOs or maybe even cryptids may be, may, big, giant, maybe, may be connected things. Parallel universes? I don't know. There, yeah. There may be... There, there's there's a lot of people that are starting to talk about there may be that these phenomena are not different like we think they might yeah. be. But mm -hmm. yes, I have never seen one, but I am absolutely fascinated with that stuff. What about Bigfoot? Are you Bigfoot? What about Bigfoot? Are you a fan? <laughs> <laughs> I am fascinated with that. Um, uh, but I am I am I am more fascinated with, like, if you had asked me 10 years ago, what do you think of Bigfoot? I would have said, yeah. I personally think that it probably exists, but it's a flesh and blood creature yeah. that we just haven't cataloged yet. Mm -hmm. But then you start reading these reports. Skinwalker Ranch is a great example. Oh, boy, of yeah. Confluence of this stuff. Uh -huh. And then you're like, well, that why would Bigfoot be doing that? And, <laughs> and again, we don't know how much of this is, is real or not. Yeah. You know, we don't, but 
it's interesting. I, I'm fascinated with these areas of high strangeness. These, you know, like yeah. like the Skinwalker Ranch. That's probably number one, hands down, place that I would want to go and spend some time at. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And my question was going to be, if you were able to get to Skinwalker Ranch, what experiment would you do first? I, I'm I'm actually really interested in some of the stuff they're doing. Yeah. Um, out there, I. I <laughs> um, I know that the the signal that what uh, one the one sixty five I I'm that's a that is a signal that actually human beings use to communicate with satellites. Yeah, mm-hmm. how that plays into effect, I don't know. I I think there's I think they're doing some very interesting things there. Mm-hmm. I think there's still a lot of question marks. Um. <laughs> But I would love to. I, 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 I want to know what's in the Mesa. I want to know what's in the Mesa. Um, but I'm also the kind of guy that will just go and, you know, break open a folding chair and just sit there for hours and yeah. watch and watch and watch. And that's, you know, I, I again I'm not a hard science guy. Um I, I I'm a cop. I'm a humanities guy. Um and what have I done most of my career, most of my professional life? Observe. Yeah. Just observe. Um and that's what I would love to do. Is just sit and observe. They've been doing some interesting things. Um my friend Matthew Jackson. They've been sending him questions to ask the spirit box regarding Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> yeah, that's totally out there to see. Perhaps, you know, there's some aliens communicating through the spirit. You're box. not going to sell me on the spirit box, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about the SLS camera? Oh, boy. <laughs> pretty. No. They make pretty dots on the wall. No, just good old fashioned gumshoe data collection. <laughs> oh, Scott wants to know: Do you use debunking method in your investigations? UK. All right. Oh, hello, um, UK. I I I I, I cautious about you the word debunking because I, I think I sometimes associate that with people like the amazing Randy. You know, that would, yeah. They would de- debunk to, you know, embarrass and insult, you know, um, to ridicule. Um, but yes, we are always looking, always looking to, to rule out the things that uh, are not anomalous, you know, could that have been caused by something or someone else? Yes. And I think that if if you're not doing that actively, um, you're remiss. So. And then this question is something that I've always wanted to try to investigate, but don't know how yet. Have you ever thought about spirits underwater? Come to Lake Lanier in Georgia. If you want to try that one. No. Wanted Lake in the country. (laughs) I've, 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 no, that's, I've, I've never. I, I've never heard of anybody really talk about that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I would love to if I could scuba dive that far, investigate the Titanic. Oh God, where it sits. <laughs> well, yeah. again, I don't know how how legitimate this is, but I have heard people talk about the fact that when they bring those large exhibits of Titanic artifacts yes. to museums uh-huh. yep. that there's strangeness that occurs mm-hmm. with some of the, the, the large like museum exhibits associated with it. Yep. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're caught up on questions. But I would think I would love to see you interview residential paranormal clients with your 
policeman training for interviewing and your observations. I mean, that to me would be because you know how to interview people and witnesses, you know, past what we, how we do it. And as thoroughly as that may be, you have a completely different training on it. We, we do. And I, I thank you. Thank you. Um, we do employ a, a methodology like mm-hmm. that. We had a potential uh, historic property slash residential case come to us um, a couple years ago. And um, myself and the other retired police officer uh, that's in our, our group uh-huh. um, went out and did three, four rounds of interviews. Yeah. Um, pages and pages of notes um, um, before. And, and we ultimately, this was not a situation that warranted us setting, setting, going in and setting up. Yeah. And that uh, determination was in part gleaned from the interviews. Um, and it's, it's just, we, we, you know, we were delving pretty deep, you know, going, especially given the nature of what they were reporting. Yeah. Um, it, it, it warranted questions on, you know, their relationships, their backgrounds, yeah. their, their, their medical histories, their, their psychiatric histories. And then also looking to say, you know, how did, not only did they answer the question, but how did they answer the question? Uh-huh. And then if you ask the question again later, did they answer it the same way? Yes. Um, so, yeah, just taking the time to talk to people and, and listen to what they're saying and, and kind of stepping back. Because sometimes in this field, I think we get very excited. Oh, sure. And, and just... People forget that critical thinking part of their interviews. Pardon? People forget the critical thinking part. Right, right. And you have to go in and and you are a, you know, you're doing what should be a dispassionate Uh interview to collect information. Have you, as a police officer, you probably, you know, you did it your whole life, can spot when someone's lying. I would think you would be able to detect a liar more easily than some other of us amateurs would. You're definitely looking for things that that would indicate that somebody is being deceptive. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, do they look at you? Um, do, you know, are are they pausing? Are they looking away? There's 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 certain little tells. Yeah. And then, you know, again, going back and having a gap and then come back and, you know, maybe you come back three or four days later and you're asking them some of the same questions or you get the same answers the same way. Yeah. And you may not. So. And we had a guest on a couple of years ago and her name went right out of my head. She was a retired police officer and she wrote the book on how to question how to interview potential Martha parents. Hazard. Martha Hazard, yes. She wrote a book on how to interview as a police officer. For yeah, and there's, you know, yeah. there's there's a couple different schools of um, training for that, but it's really just watch people's body language. Yeah. You know, really take the time to look at people's body language. How do they sit when they talk to you? Mm-hmm. You know, um, how do they position themselves? Yeah, we like to interview clients via Zoom and um, record them, you know, and you can just see a lot of things just by sitting and talking to somebody. Look, you can also see what's around them (laughs) if you're on Zoom. And, 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 Uh, you know, whenever possible, I want to interview somebody in the space you know, if at all possible. And, and that, you know, that can come with its own set of pitfalls and risks, yeah. of course, mm-hmm. you know, especially if you're dealing with somebody who's maybe unstable. 
Um, yeah. But I like to look around. Is you know, is there indication of um, medical or psychiatric problems? Are there mm-hmm. indications of drug use? Are there indications of uh, alcohol abuse? Um, do I go in and their place is filled with, you know, uh, ghost and horror books and <laughs> movies exactly. yeah. and all kinds of media and fandom associated with the paranormal? Uh-huh. Because then I start kind of going, well, is this person kind of predisposed uh-huh. to, to some of this stuff psychologically? You know, um, what's going on here? And I think sometimes you have to be um, be aware of the vocabulary they're using when you're interviewing them, because sometimes they use paranormal TV show vocabulary, right. and that's right. a big telltale sign when they're I able, agree. when they I say agree. these things. It's like uh, the average Joe would not know what this this term is. So. I, I agree, and, and you know. Red flag. It's, it's the double-edged sword of paranormal entertainment. Any questions pop up? Yep, there's a couple. Um, okay. Scott wants to know, what do you think of ghost hunting apps on phones? Would you use them? No, I don't, I don't, I don't put any stock in them. I don't. Okay. And then Nicole wants to know, is it safe to carry a weapon on a location for protection? Mm. Excellent question. Mm. First of all, if you are legal to possess and carry such weapon, sure. If you are within the rules specified by the, the venue you're in, yeah. sure. Um, I would be cautious from a liability standpoint for your organization. If, you, if it's <coughs> just a um, John Q citizen, or Jane Q citizen um, that, that's carrying it. Um, um, you know, I, I just, again, can you legally carry it? Can you legally carry it in that space? Um, and then of course the liability issue. Um, have I carried? Do I carry? Um, yeah, but I also carried every time I left my house for yeah. years um, as a result of my job. Um, and, you know, ethically, um, you know, obviously there are practical considerations, but ethically you're, you're always on duty and in the Commonwealth of Virginia, cops are mandatory reporters mm. of nurses and teachers. Yeah. They're mandatory reporters. For like situations of abuse and neglect, things yeah. like that. Um, so, um, I just say, you know, if it, outside of outside of like active law enforcement, you know, I just I just be cautious. That's all. Nicole, we hope you're not going to a location that would require you to have that type of protection. Where are you investigating, girl? So I know not to go. <laughs> Yeah, she says all she has right now is pepper spray at the moment that she carries. <laughs> and then York wants to know, would a spirit be more willing to overtake a person, a mentally ill person? That's a question that I can't scientifically answer. Uh, again, we are pursuing this from a, a, a purely scientific standpoint that kind of goes into the, you know, the religious or the metaphysical. Um, I have my own opinions on that, but that's outside of, of, uh, of that, which we could prove or show data for. Mm-hmm. I, I, on a personal level, as somebody who is a person of faith mm-hmm. um, and who has been doing this for years, I think so, but can I prove that with data? No, I cannot. Mm-hmm. York, as a spiritualist myself, and having a little different perspective, depends on the spirit. Is that spirit that is still here on the earth plane a type of person that would attack the vulnerable? And 
are not, you know, a, a, a nice, if you were a nice person here, you would not want to attack someone who's vulnerable in, in that situation. So it, it depends, you know? Mm -hmm. And then Mark says, I really think it would be powerful if your methodology was validated with the experiences a purely spiritual person was having at the same time during an investigation. What are your thoughts? It'd be a, be a fun experiment. And I'd love to see Mark again. So it's been too long. So. Where's Mark live since you know him? Where's Mark he? lives uh, about an hour west of me. Oh, okay. Not that far. Yep. And then Bob wants to know, do you think the courts will ever accept the existence of the paranormal? Whew. That's a good one. Um, I think if you could show data, I think if you could show uh, quantifiable, repeating data, uh, perhaps... Um, I, I think that's probably what it, what it would take. But then at that point, is it paranormal anymore? Yeah. Or, or is it the, the, the normal that we still don't quite understand? Mm -hmm. Well, Bob, as someone that ended up in court as a paranormal person once because of what we observed at a location... It wasn't the paranormal causing the problem. It was someone doing something that they shouldn't and putting children in danger. Mm -hmm. And we reported it. And we had video evidence of the environment and the situation and what the mother was saying, which was compelling enough that it brought child services to the location. So the and courts... We had the evidence that the court needed to act. So it wasn't that they believed in the paranormal. They believed in what the paranormal team presented to them was valid enough that they saw they needed to go get those kids. And I, th I think that um, kind of opens up that discussion of, you know, the, the, the courts, the law, yeah. to be this field. Um, you know, you're starting to have places around the country, states, because the states are largely ones that regulate this, this stuff. Yeah. Um, looking at, well, you're calling yourself an investigator. What do you investigate? Because uh -huh. in Virginia, we have what's the, the State Department of Criminal Justice Services, right? And they regulate law enforcement corrections, private security, and alarm companies. And private security includes private investigators, right? So you're doing investigations. And then you said client. It's like, we don't even use the word client anymore because that infers money exchange and, and, a, and a relationship and a duty. And you know, so we don't even use the word client anymore. Um, and, and, so I think as things progress forward and, you know, there has been litigation related to the conduct of paranormal groups, we're going to have to be careful um, how, how we do things. And that, you know, so that we really pressed forward with insurance, for example, um, just as, as a means to protect ourselves. We changed verbiage like, you know, you'll never hear us say client again. Um, because we're not taking any money. We, we, you know, that's not how we operate. Uh, we don't even say the word investigate. We talk about research uh -huh. and, and which really is what it is. Uh -huh. You know, we're just calling it what it is. We're doing research. Uh -huh. Um, because you know, you get, well, we do investigations. Well, are you licensed? Are you bonded? Are you insured? Do you have a compliance agent? And, we may find states start asking these questions. Mm -hmm. Well, if they start and doing harm people. to people, like the team that tells them they've got demons in there under the bed, and yeah, right, and, the, and that person went out and caused harm to the, someone or themselves, right? And I can only imagine that something horrible or catastrophic and high profile happened, 
And all of a sudden, our legislature goes, you know what? Any of you guys that are out here chasing ghosts, you now have to be licensed as private investigators through the Department of Criminal Justice Services. And if you're not, it's class one misdemeanor. Right. It yep. sounds crazy, but it's plausible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that I've been trying to I'm working on. That's my project for this year is to push forward, not so much to have the government regulate paranormal investigations, but, but have <laughs> something in place to where if you're going to investigate a client's uh -huh. home or have clients, that you have to do something along the lines, um, almost like medical professionals. You have to register with the state. You have to have your insurance. You have to have, and so that way these farther. clients know. I don't want us to ever have to register with the state. No, <laughs> but it, it's, it's more to protect the client. Because yeah. these people are calling people that are coming in not knowing what they're doing, causing more harm than good. If there was some sort of, you know, at least tracking method Protocol. to know who's causing I mean, harm and who's not and who's, you know, legitimate. And, and that, that's where we're going to have to do a really good job, I think, of self-policing. Mm -hmm. And that really then boils down to what is each individual group doing. And I can tell you what we do. I, I can't, you know. Again, we're not the end-all, be-all. We don't have all the answers. Um, but, you know, we, we have, if we're doing something like a private residence, we, we have a signed agreement. You know, oh, that yeah. understand, you know, this is what we will do and this is what we will not do, right? Oh, um, and we make it clear. We don't get rid of things. We don't, you know, we're not going to come in and tell you your house is haunted. Um, and... We, we've even developed, and, and we're still in the, we, we're putting some final touches on it, but basically a, a code of ethics, a code of conduct slash code of ethics for our organization mm -hmm. that would be front facing so that you go to our website and you say, this is the professional standard embodied in writing for this organization. Yeah. It's backed up by our bylaws and supported by our insurance policy um, that says, you know, if, if, if I get into bed with CPRI, I know what to expect. Right. You know? yep. And that's what every team needs to do if they're going to help other people. It doesn't need to be the exact same thing, verbiage or methodology that you guys use, but they need to have everything laid out so people know what they're getting into. And that's what needs to be regulated. People need to know what they're getting into, and, and, I, and not. I, cautious, I caution organizations to talk about things in terms of helping people. Mm -hmm. You know, because what do again? There's that issue of this is what I believe, and this is what I can prove, mm -hmm. right? So, how am I helping you if I can't prove that I'm helping you? What's right. what's the what's the the standard by which you are helped, mm -hmm. right? Um. If I'm saying that, for example, our, our, my particular organization does cleansings, what's the standard? What could I take to a court of law and say, I cleansed this place of spirits? Okay, well, the court's going to go, well, we don't, we don't talk about spirits. This is court, mm -hmm. right? Um, and can you prove you cleansed it? What is it? Mm -hmm. But then again, you have to swear on the Bible and to God that you're going to tell the truth. Where's God? Prove God's in the court. I just work here. <laughs> See? Yeah, it's so funny that but, the, the double standards on something. But 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 it's it's um and and a lot of courts that don't even you know that they, they they don't they're not even put their hands on the Bible anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, down here in the south, you do. Um, the um. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'm helping people. Well, how are you helping people? How can you show you're helping people? Yeah, maybe you are, and maybe I believe you. But if I'm just going to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. what am I doing? Yep. Well, when you have, um, let's say, a, a person who contacts you in with fear something's going on they're frightened they're frightened of what's going on in the home blah 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 the responsible thing is should be to calm their feel fears the best way you can by explaining look what you're experiencing 
maybe something completely organic and natural. You're just not aware of it because you don't have the experiences that we do because we've done this for so long. Right. So calm down and let us see what we can find because what you're experiencing may be completely logical and explainable. Mm -hmm. That's what had that happen recently yeah. before the holidays. We did get a, a an inquiry. Mm -hmm. And I spent and, and this, this these people had moved from California to Virginia. They'd been here a few years, but they were in rural Virginia near a major battlefield site. Oh yeah. And they were reporting uh, among other things, light anomalies behind the house. Right. And it was, they, they were the, the, the woman that I spoke to was very freaked out, and, you yeah. know, very quick to go down the, the, the spiritual, uh, you know, this is, you know, this is ghosts. I'm in danger. Yeah. You know? And, you know, one of the first things I tell people is like, I'm not going to, to tell you that you have a ghost in your place at home. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm going to present to you, if appropriate, some possible alternatives. Yeah. And from there, the facts and the data take us where the facts and the data take us. Um, but, you know, we need to be open to other possibilities. Uh -huh. Right. Now, if some, if I tell that to somebody and they get very upset with me. Yeah which they have, mm -hmm. um, then I know we're not the ones for you. Problem, right. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not, and I tell them very, I told this lady, I, I said, I'm not here to, to validate or substantiate what you're saying. I'm not here to mock it either. Right. I'm just here to let's listen. Let's talk about it. Let's see where, where it goes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it ended up being a situation where um, when we hung up the phone, mm -hmm. there was no need for us to come out yeah. and do anything. And exactly. I said, look, we have an ongoing interest in that particular geographic location, right? Because of some things that are adjacent to it that we are currently conducting research at. You know, if you keep seeing these light anomalies, we might love to come and set up some cameras, mm -hmm. you know, on your property or some sound equipment on your property, if you're willing. But I said, there's nothing you're telling me right now that leads me to think that you're in any sort of danger whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just kind of part and parcel with living where you live. Uh -huh. you know. Um, mm -hmm. And that seemed to put her at ease. And I think when we hung up the phone, everything was OK. I said, you, you're welcome to call us back. Um, but I think she was very alarmed and then got calmer. So that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's not what's happening, though, in this field. And that's, that's what breaks my heart. Because yeah. I've been on calls when I was part of another group and other teams where even it going to the client's home for the first time, where other investigators on my own team were like, you know, they meet the client, they say, hello, how are you? Before they even hear anything that's happening to the client, it's, oh, you have a demon in your home or, you know, and, and or someone says that this is happening in my home. And it's like, oh, yeah, you need to, you know, get out of your house. And it's like, well, wait, wait, what? Why are you telling people this? I know. I mean, it, this is somebody on your team. It, it was on a team I was on previously, as well as uh, another group that I was a part of. Similar I, things I, would, like I that. would probably not be able to contain myself. I, I mean, I, that's the kind of thing that we are really hurting ourselves. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, I look at so, so University of Virginia, for example, has um, the UVA Center for Perceptual Studies, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of people at one of the preeminent universities in the United States, if not the world, that has a department with people that are really interested in this stuff. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right? now, granted, yeah. they're doing a lot of stuff with uh, near-death experiences. That okay. that They're really into that stuff. Yeah. But they're really interested in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I want other universities to be interested in this stuff. Yep. And that it is used to be. I don't know if they still are or not, but pardon? 
Duke University used Duke, to be. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, when they the something else, it was the Ryan Institute at one point. Ryan, yeah. The um, they're not going to do that if we look like a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> and that that that's where I mean, I guess that's what I mean by when I it needs to be more. I guess I we do need to more self policing. And, and that's and what I mean I by more regulation because it's we're right looking now. like fools out there. I don't know how that happens. Mm -hmm. Absent more organizations coming together with um, tighter standards, mm -hmm. um, you know, written standards, regular practices and procedures. A code of ethics for how you cooperate, how you conduct yourself, um, proper record keeping, you know, mm -hmm. professional conduct when dealing with the public, you know, and unless and until that happens, and, and unfortunately, we have a field right now that is filled with a lot of people that are more enthusiasts than there are researchers, researchers or explorers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, it's riddled with enthusiasts. And then we've also created this environment of, you know, paranormal em entertainment is so, yeah, you know, it's so people love it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a huge market for it. So I, I you know, I think there's a lot of people that get into this with like, you know, the ultimate job. I'm going to have a book. I'm going to have a lecture circuit. I'm going to have a YouTube channel. I'm going to have a, uh, um, uh, 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 a, a TV show. Hmm. And none of those things are wrong. Uh -huh. I'd love to have a TV show. But that's not why I do this. Yeah. yeah. So I don't bemoan the people that do. But... <sighs> Yeah. It, it's sad because I get calls still today from people looking for help because they've reached out to groups I've been a part of in the past mm -hmm. and they're telling me things that they're being told and it's still the same stuff going on. They're, they're being told they have a demon in their house and they right. need to get, you know, an exorcism right away. And it's it's really scary but you, what's happening to these people. And, and you have you have groups, too, that, you know, they don't want to share data. They don't want to share findings. They don't want to share locations. I will tell you right now, and I can speak for our organization, we will share every piece of data mm -hmm. that we are allowed to share. Like if I have a like a uh, location where I can't disclose that location because yeah. of the agreement we have with that, then I'm not going to disclose it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But we are sitting on terabytes of data that we're happy to share. Right. We're happy to share. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're sitting like, again, we are not the end all be all. We don't have all the answers. We make mistakes. We've grown and evolved as an organization. Um, but, you know, if somebody goes, how do you guys do it? What is, what is your bylaws look at? How do you structure your organization? How do you, you know, what is your RMS system like? Walk me through your methods because we want to do out here in uh, Oregon, what you guys are doing here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Take it all. We're happy to share it with you. Mm -hmm. We're happy to share it with you. And if you figure out something better than we did, let us know because we're we may start doing it. And nobody wants to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Former teammates that we moved on that claim just uh, complained about. The paperwork, the paperwork, and I was like, "You knew what you signed up for when you read the eighty-two page manual that I created for my team. You're going to do paperwork because if it's not documented, it didn't happen." And it's like, mm -hmm. "So why are you complaining about this now when you knew?" Right. And that's we where you paperwork. Develop, you know, we've gotten to where we develop kind of roles within the agency, you know, within the organization where we have, you know, Brad is, you know, he he is a nuts and bolts, facts and figures. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a, he's a straight scientist. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Tommy is too, you know. Jack has that background, but he's much more of a social scientist, our, our, our VP. Um, <clears throat> and then you have me, as Brad would say. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we, we try to play to our strengths, right? 
Um, there, there is things that I can do that that Brad, as a, as a you know, as a, a old fashioned data scientist, simply cannot do. And there's a whole bunch of things that he can do that I can't do. Um, but and, and that's that's one of the reasons, like you know, people well, are like, the team. group, and we're open to to general membership, right? But we are also trying to bring people on that have skill sets and backgrounds that meet our research needs. Yep. You know, and and right now, you know, our membership is um, people with science backgrounds, engineering backgrounds, computing backgrounds, archaeology, history, sociology, medicine, education, law enforcement, um, because these are skill sets that you can put into a pot and mix them up like a salad. And, you know, you you have these disciplines that, you know, I think ostensibly can work really well together. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Anything else, Philip? We have about three minutes. I didn't oh, make anybody I'm... angry yet, did I? Oh. <laughs> no, no angry well, comments yet. Well, we'll get the hate mail tomorrow. Okay. If you didn't, we didn't do it right then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be the one to get the hate mail because I said it needs to be regulated. I get hate uh, mail for that all the time, but I, you know, and I'm not even sure I, I like, I like, God, I really do not want to see it regulated. I want to see us regulate ourselves. It, yeah, yeah it's something needs to be done to separate well. the enthusiasts from. I mean, I, I personally want to see this as a real science. I, I, the I do too. Pseudoscience cringes me. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I, I I'm gonna try to make Brad proud of me and say we are. He's not watching good. anymore, so you're good. Um, <laughs> He's not watching anymore, oh, so you're yeah, good. More than last. Um, <laughs> I think we are regulated, in so if we follow scientific principles and scientific ethics mm-hmm. as they are commonly recognized, you know, and we do that, we are regulated. We are regulating mm-hmm. ourselves, but we are regulated. Yeah. But you know, there there's a difference. Ghost hunters and paranormal researcher investigators. The mm-hmm. ghost hunters don't give a darn about data. <clears throat> they nope. want to go get evidence and make the their REM pods go off. You know, and that's never going to be a group that's conforms to any type of protocols. It's just not what they want to do. And you know, I get that, but if and you're you know watching, I'm okay yeah, with it. Yeah. I'm okay mm-hmm. with it. As still, long as there's a clear de- delineation between the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And still and need to treat that space respectively, you know, respectfully, because you you can ruin it for other people but mm-hmm. that want to come behind you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But if you're there, going there needs into to be a line between everyone. If you're going into someone's home, their sanctuary, their safe space, you need to know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And not tell them they have demons in their house. And I mean, unless mm-hmm. they do, but but um, and, and be willing to listen to your digital voice recorder. I mean, we had a girl on yeah. the one team I was on in Vegas. We asked for all the digital voice recordings, and she's like, "Oh, I don't listen to my digital voice recorder." She brings it with her on every investigation, and the one time we asked her for it, she finally admitted she never listened to it. And the point would be. <laughs> okay she's coming for the snacks or something i, well, I will tell you one thing we do as a procedure uh, um but so there's certain things that um that i like i i don't always listen to my own audio right yeah mm-hmm. but but what we do do is we'll be out say we're out saturday night we're doing a research project sunday morning usually brad as the research coordinator goes here is the data repository yeah. right Dump your odd and it will be divided up, right? And we're using cloud storage. <clears throat> and we say, you know, I'm going to drop all my audio here. I'm going to drop any video or still here. I'm going to uh, drop my uh, EDI data here. And it all goes into the pile. And then it's all archived. Mm-hmm. And yep. anybody in the group can access it. Yeah. yeah. So no, she didn't buy- do that. She just deleted it when she got home. Oh man! I mean, this is <laughs> like why bring it? This is like one of my teammates' reports from just her camera that she was assigned to review. I mean, this is you know, each person has mm-hmm. to review one of our team cameras, and then they have to review their own things after the team equipment is reviewed. 
you know, because everybody has body cameras, you know. You know, if you want to be on my team, that's what you got to do. I mean, that's. <laughs> and then I have to go through it all. <laughs> We've actually had a discussion of, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we it could bring on, you know, maybe one or two people that literally had no interest in going out and doing anything. Yeah. That would, you know, like, you know, somebody who's got the skill set and maybe they're like, I'm retired and I have this particular skill set and I'm willing to sit at my house and listen to your audio and go through your data all day. Like, like what we, we actually came up like, oh, like, well, we have analysts, like actual analysts. Wouldn't it be great? Yeah. And that would be better too, because they wouldn't have been at the location. Yeah. Even better. Yep. I just yeah. want somebody to carry my equipment cases. That's all I want. <laughs> I'm getting old. That stuff's getting heavier and heavier. It is. It is. It is. <clears throat> okay. So before we close out, Alan, do you want to let everybody know where they can find you? Sure. They can uh, find us uh, at our website, which is centerpri.org. Um, we also try to stay active on uh, our Facebook page, uh, which is just Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation, CPRI. Um, you can find us on Facebook. Um, and those, those tend to be the two things that we're dealing with the most. Um, we try, we have a Twitter, but uh, I don't know that we always have a lot to tweet about. <laughs> we try to stay up on, the, uh, on Facebook. You got to move to Instagram, Twitter's, Twitter's the old I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm 50. <laughs> I know. I, I'm 58, and the whole, that whole thing is like, what? And algorithms, and Tiffany on our team's like, well, the Google algorithm, and the, this, I'm like, uh, no, 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 no. I, I'm, no uh, oddly enough, I, 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 just as a, as a side note, I have, um, uh, my own podcast and I'm starting to, which has nothing to do with paranormal stuff. Actually. Oh, well, um, it is, it is not a paranormal podcast. Um, but I, uh, I'm, I'm learning that stuff. It's, it's a, a different result. world. Yep. It's I'm like learning. stream yard. There's no way on earth I can talk, put up the questions <laughs> that, that thought of that makes me want to hurl. We're oh, just podcasting that? right now. We're not doing the we we haven't gotten to this yet. This is yeah. my goal. Um, is yeah. is Bob still on? <laughs> he was talking about paranormal <clears throat> and courts. Watch the Netflix. Is it Netflix? Um, the Devil on Trial. Is that the Devil on Trial? It's interesting. Yeah, they tried to use that in a court of law as defense <laughs> that he was possessed, and that didn't go too well. <laughs> <clears throat> So there's there's a sample for you, Bob, if you want to, an example for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And you can always follow us on Facebook at Ghost Education 101 or catch the replay on YouTube, where we also air live now at Ghost Education 101. And then we air every other week when we are live on Parallax TV on Facebook, where most of you guys tonight are watching from. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And in two weeks, we will be back with a presentation on the history of witches and vampires through the ages. This is a presentation that I, it's actually two presentations. I'm merging into one that I did here in Orlando for Phantasm last year, and a lot of people really loved it. So stay tuned for that one. And then on January 31st, we have a panel discussion of women of the paranormal with Alex Matsuo, Julie Holiday, Katie Foreman, and Sin Schrader Hill will be joining me for that pair, uh, round table. So that should be an interesting discussion that we have there. So again, thank you everyone for watching and we thank will you, see Alan. you in thank two you weeks. Yes, thank me. you, Alan, for being here. And thank I'll make sure I get you the links and everything once everything uploads uh, to YouTube so that way you have it to share. And I will be in touch because later this season we do have um, the paranormal and law enforcement panel discussion. Oh. That would be awesome. Yes, yeah. so I know I have Larry um, Lawson on that one, and then I wanted to get you and a few others on there as well. Oh, uh, Larry's good people. Yeah, yes, he is. Larry. I love Larry. Yeah, <laughs> yep. I love hearing him talk. So, okay, well, we are good to go. So, thank you, everyone. Thank and you, everybody. We'll see you Welcome two weeks. to 2024. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, I'm getting to the, there we go, outro. Have a good day. <laughs>